All right, gonna do a sound check here. Can everybody hear me okay? Can you see me okay? Hi, everybody. Let me know uh, in the chat box if you can hear and see uh, everything. It's a hot day here. The fan is going. The swamp cooler is going in the background. I'm hoping the mic isn't picking it up too much. <coughs> Thought I'd do a little FaceTime for the last class. Nice. How's everybody doing out there today? We've got our first 90 degree day. Actually, we had a 90 degree day, I think last month, maybe a couple, but we're, we're breaking 90 today. It's, it's already starting. All right, I, I think I'm gonna I'm just gonna jump into it here. If that's okay with everybody. We might have another couple of folks pop on last minute, but um, if anybody misses anything, you can always just download or stream the video later tonight. Oh man, Teresa, I'm so jealous. We had like we didn't have a winter. That's why it makes the summer just so jarring when it starts in April to be 90 degrees when we didn't really have that much cold and barely any rain. Still working on the shed. Awesome. All right, well, let's, let's just get into it. Thank you so much for being a part of this course. Um, I'm really grateful. I really enjoyed myself. I hope that you've had a really good time and have gotten a lot of value from the information and in all the classes. Um, so today is going to be our last class. And uh, I'm going to mention this kind of towards the end again, but I really would love to stay in touch with, with each and every one of you. So please keep in touch with me. Let me know how your projects are going. I know all of you are deep into something that you're working on in your garden or your farm. And um, it's been great to, to just communicate with everybody and hear about all of your projects. So um, I'm gonna send out an email again today, later on this evening, uh, just asking some questions about the course and um, just some questions about you and what you're working on again. Um, a lot of you kind of answered those questions towards the beginning of the course, and hopefully I've helped you with that process, but I want to know kind of where you're at now and um, what your plans are again for the year and how I can best help, because I would love to keep in touch. Um, so today's, today's class is going to be kind of short, uh, unless we get into a longer Q&A, which um, I would love to do. We didn't have uh, a class on Saturday morning. Um, so the uh, last week's class must have been thorough enough that folks didn't have any questions, which is great. And uh, not a whole lot of feedback as far as um, anything that I didn't cover in the class that I wanted to go over today. So um, that's good, I suppose. And today's Q&A after, after the class is going to be just wide open 
um, for anything that's going on with your garden, your farm, um, and your seed saving process. Uh, so I'd be happy to do a good Q and A today. So let me know. Um, so I'm going to just go to a screen share and, uh, and show you a couple of web resources that have been really, really helpful. Some of these, I hope at this point, you're already familiar with. Some of them, maybe not. Um, and, uh, and so here we go. Let's see if I can get this to work here. Yes. All right. <clears throat> all right, so the Organic Seed Alliance, you all are already probably familiar um, they put out the seed saving guide that is linked to in the portal. By the way, all of these pages I'm going to show you right now, I've added to the very top of the student portal page. Um, so if you can't find those now, if you're not going through this now um, and looking at these pages simultaneously, um, which you know you don't need to, I would just suggest following along right now and then visiting them afterwards. Um, but the Organic Seed Alliance, not only do they put out that seed saving guide that's awesome, but they have some other courses on here. Um, and I'm going to show you that right now. So if you go to seedalliance.org, click on the education button, it will take you to this page. And um, they have the fundamentals of seed production. And this course is the extension.org course that I'm going to show you again next. Um, here's the guide, the seed saving guide for farmers and gardeners. They have some variety trials paperwork. Um, and then they also have publications. So let's click on the publications. And if we go down on the publications page, this is an interesting report, by the way, if you're really into this and want to lead and read a really kind of thick long-winded report on the state of organic seed. It talks a lot about uh, GMOs and just where the process is with organic seed production, kind of more on the professional level. And this, the Organic Seed Alliance, as well as the extension.org course, they both lean towards the, the professional seed grower side of the spectrum, um, which means it might be a little bit too detailed or thick for what you're working on, possibly, but it also means that the information is quality because it's it's geared towards professionals. So the numbers that they talk about and the issues that they talk about um, are usually really relevant regardless of your scale and, uh, and just quality information. Um, so here's the Variety Trials um, publications. And that's for, uh, and this is just a guide for trialing out varieties. That might be self-evident, but there's a very kind of meticulous um, way to do it and to do it well and professionally. So this is whenever they do larger scale breeding projects and they want to actually grow them out on a certain scale with a certain set of standards when it comes to um, analyzing the results, they go by these variety trial um, methods. And so this is a great resource for that. This is a trials report. You can actually see what the report looks like. Um, they did a number of trials here, broccoli, kale, Swiss chard, green beans, Japanese cucumber. I highly recommend checking this out. In fact, let's see, is this a download? This is a download. Um, okay, let's see. You know what, I'm actually not gonna go into that right now. I'll let you look at that yourself. So that, uh, this just shows you kind of the results of the trial, of the variety trial. And it really highlights the differences in quality between um, between sources of seed. So, for example, the kale that they did was the Lacinato kale um, or the dinosaur kale, and that one variety is obviously very popular. They sourced it from, you know, 10, 15 different sources, and the results were very, very different. Um, more variety trial stuff, plant breeding toolkit, participatory plant breeding. That's again, more of a professional sort of um, uh, situation where multiple farmers in multiple climates will breed the same variety. And um, there's a whole method to how it's done. The seed is then collected together and cast back out to those farmers to do it again year over year. Um, 
Introduction to on-farm plant breeding. If you want to get more into actually breeding different varieties, that's a great document. Um, and then there's all of these uh, specific documents for carrots, tomatoes, sweet corn. Really good stuff. There's the seed saving guide again. And then principles and practices. They, I wish they would put out more of these. I think they have five or six. They have six. So they have spinach, radish, lettuce, carrot, beet, and bean. If you're going to be growing a seed crop of any of these crops, definitely download these documents. They're very, very in-depth. And honestly, it's probably going to be, um, besides this book that I'm going to point you to in a few minutes, The Organic Seed Grower by John Navazio, this is probably the best information, the most in-depth information that you're going to find on the individual crops. And then these are the links to the extension.org. I believe that's what these are links to, the extension.org tutorials. Let's see. Yes. OK, so there are uh, a lot of resources here. The Organic Seed Alliance, click on Education, or this page that I'm at right now is the Publications. Um, everything is free. And the Organic Seed Alliance themselves is an awesome resource. Um, if any of you ever have problems, especially when it comes to um, growing kind of more on a professional level or breeding, um, well, first of all, you can get a hold of me and I'd be happy to help you. But they're also a really good resource. Um, and you can send them an email and they'll do their best to help you out. So let's move next to, by the way, they are a nonprofit and um, if any of you all are interested in collaborating with their production, um, if you're growing on more of a farm scale um, and you're interested in doing this professionally, contact them about that. They're also always looking for help with donations and they're definitely a worthy cause. All right, so let's jump over to the next here, which is the extension.org. Um, Course, and I hope that all of you at this point have at least checked this out. I'm going to go into it uh, really quick here as well. So if you haven't created an account, you're going to need to create a new account here. I already have, so I'm just going to log in. And they have a whole bunch of courses on the extension.org campus. Um, and I'm just going to look at the seed production course. But it's worth checking out for some of their other topics, for sure. And you can see a lot of the contributors to this course um, are folks involved with the Organic Seed Alliance. Uh, Jared is uh, he's with the Organic Seed Alliance. And um, Joel is a seed grower, a professional seed grower for Seeds of Change. John Navazio um, used to be with the Seed Alliance. I think he's now works for Johnny's Seeds. And he's the author of The Organic Seed Grower. Don Tipping is a seed grower in Southern Oregon and a total character. Shelly, I don't know who that is. She did the video, apparently. And Jody is another uh, excellent contact at High Mowing Seeds. She's an expert with diseases, but she's an all-around um, expert with growing seed. So let's scroll down and check this out. Seed crops for your climate. If you remember when I went into climatic considerations, um, I believe that was module three or four, uh, we went through this course, essentially. So um, that's a, a good one. And most of this, keep in mind, this is dealing mainly with the Western region of North America. So take all of the information with a little bit of a grain of salt, but it's generally applicable to any climate. And they go in specifically to onions, beets, and chard, Brassicas, carrot, lettuce, wet seeds, it's just general for all wet seeds, and disease. There's a course on seed quality. And then they have this section down at the bottom, other references, resources, and links. So let's check this out. One of the links is back to the Organic Seed Alliance where we just were. The extension.org resource guide. Let's go there. And again, we're dealing with the same folks. Michaela 
and Lori from the OSA. Um, Organics, uh, Oregon State University is very much involved with um, uh, organic and open pollinated plant breeding and all, all varieties of plant breeding actually. So they're, they get involved with OSA. Um, some little information here about organic seed production. And then down at the very bottom, there's a couple dozen links. I'm not gonna click on these because this can kind of turn into a rabbit hole, but all of it is very good information. So again, this is the course from extension.org. And at the very bottom of that course, there's a reference link and that took me to these other references. The other main seed saving reference that I want to link you to, and this gets a little bit into breeding, but it's mainly for growing seeds, doing so organically. It's a very good book, and I highly recommend that to everybody. Um, this is kind of a step up adjunct to the free download from OSA, the uh, Seed Saving Guide for Farmers and Gardeners. And this is uh, this book is by John Navazio. Um, it's called The Organic Seed Grower, and it's a farmer's guide to vegetable seed production. If you're not a farmer, if you're just a backyard gardener, backyard gardener, this is still a great resource. Um, I'm not going to flip through the book too much here, but I just wanted to mention that again. Um, I link to this book also in um, on the portal page, so you can check it out there. Um, as far as other seed saving specific resources, um, again, Organic Seed Alliance, the extension.org is a great information source. Um, for ongoing um, assistance, keep in touch with me. And if you have any questions that are beyond what I can help with, I'll uh, send you over to Jared at uh, the Organic Seed Alliance and most likely um, we'll be able to help you out. Um, so yeah, these two resources, uh, very deep, very extensive, and have at it. I want to show you a couple of other resources for farming. Um, and again, if you're uh, gardening in your backyard, um, or your front yard, I guess, or you've got a homestead situation, um, this is still really good information. But these two sources, um, when I was farming, were very, very helpful with a number of uh, aspects of the process. So the first one is SARI, uh, Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education. And they have a really, really awesome source of uh, downloadable, free downloadable PDFs. You can actually buy the print versions of these books, but you can download the PDFs for free. So if you go to uh, sareseri.org, click on Learning Center, and that brings you to this page here. Um, so we go, let's see, Learning Center, Books. And all of these are free downloads, or you can buy the print version. Um, building Soils for Better Crops, that's one that we downloaded. I think we actually bought the print version of that one. Really, really awesome um, information for, for building soils. It gets into cover cropping, it gets into composting, um, manures, um, soil assessment. It's just an, a really awesome guide. Um, they have a great one on uh, building a farm business. Crop rotation is another great one. Um, managing insects, and then I think they have one cover. Pro yeah, managing cover crops profitably. Uh, don't be uh, misdirected by the title. It's not just all about how to profit from them. They really get into um, an in-depth discussion of cover crops, which cover crops to use, in which climate, and for what purpose. So judging by where your soil is at, what time of the year it is, what your goals are, um, this book can help you pick out cover crops um, for your situation. Again, a free download. So this 
highly recommend that you at least download a couple of these um, based on whatever your interests are, and they're really helpful. I haven't even gone deep into this resource, but uh, it looks like they have some other courses. Um, fact sheets and bulletins, I'm not sure what those are about. I've mainly gone to the books, but uh, definitely check it out, sare.org. And the other one, which is uh, somewhat similar in, in style, is ATRA. It's a sustainable agricultural resource. And um, that's A-T-T-R-A dot N-C-A-T dot org. And again, the link is in the portal page. So let's go to ATRA, Master Publication List. And within this list, uh, let's check out some of it. Let's go to soils and compost. Here we go. A bunch of downloadable PDFs. Some of them 99 cents for, uh, for the PDF if you're a non-member, or 99 cents for a Kindle download. Uh, but otherwise, basically free. Um, biodynamics, free or very inexpensive. Basics of composting, cover cropping and organic systems. Uh, between this one and the managing cover crops from Sari, uh, excellent cover crop resource. So ATRA, A-T-T-R-A, and Sari are two really awesome resources for farming. Oh, now we're just, this is a whole page for all of the, uh, all of the downloads, field crops. Okay, so between those two farming resources and the seed saving resources, um, and uh, uh, keeping in touch with me, I think that you are in a good place, regardless of what you're working on. Um, that's that's going to be it for the resources I want to share with you today. Um, I also want to mention on the portal page at the very bottom, I have a bunch of links to recommended tools. So there's uh, a sprinkler that I really, really love, um, an overhead sprinkler. There is a digging fork. There's a number of other tools um, that I find to be pretty essential to uh, the gardening or the farming process. Um, so if you want to check that out, the very bottom of the page in the portal page. And then I also just wanted to mention again that I want to send out, I'm going to send out an email later today that I would love it if you uh, responded to that email and let me know kind of where you're at. Um, if there's anything that I didn't cover that you wanted to go more in depth into, we can have a conversation there through email. Um, let me know what you're working on and how I can best help you from this point forward. So I want to make sure that um, you're in a good place to carry on what you've learned in this course and get to where you want to go. So um, thank you very much for being a part of this course and for coming here today. Um, I want to open up a Q&A. Let me know if you have any questions about any of the resources I just covered or just a very general Q&A. Um, anything I missed that you felt I missed during the course that you want to talk about now, gardening, farming, or any of your seed saving questions, um, let's do it. Teresa, uh, going to tell us how to make seed cleaning screens. I have another question too, but I can't remember. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, seed cleaning screens. Um, so what you're going to want to do is um, a very basic set of screens you can make from really easy to find materials. 
of hardware cloth, basically. And so hardware cloth is the galvanized metal screen that usually comes in a roll, and it comes in typically three different sizes, half inch, quarter inch, and eighth inch. Um, so you can make three screens really easily by cutting a square or a circle, I suppose, but a square would be easier. Um, you know, 12 inches or so of these three different sizes of hardware cloth and building a basic, um, a basic wooden box frame. Uh, attaching the screen to the bottom of that frame and if you want to actually attach another piece of uh, wood to the bottom of that screen, um, that will protect your hands from the cut edge of the metal. So I'm going to kind of show you, let me go to my website really quick and I'll show you um, I'll show you kind of the basic design of, of how I build my screens. Okay. So let's, this photo I think will be the best here. Okay, so you can see I basically just cut these pieces 11 and 3 quarter inches or so and nail the end of the board into the end grain of the next board and do that all the way around. Um, I glue them and use staples, but you can use screws or nails if you want. And then the cut piece of screen attaches to the bottom. And then there's another about one inch thick piece that I attach by stapling into the bottom of these larger pieces. So these larger pieces are two inches uh, wide. The bottom one is one inch wide. And if you can see the seam here on the top piece is overlapped by the bottom piece and the seam is on the opposite side of that joint. So that makes it really, really strong. Um, if you want to build your own screens from from these type of, uh, from stainless steel, um, you can do that by sourcing it from a number of different manufacturers. Uh, if you're interested in doing that, let me know. I'll link you to the one that I buy the screen from. But I'm gonna tell you that if you buy cut pieces, just one of a certain size, it's gonna be more expensive to buy a set of one screen than it is to buy the entire set from me or from buying them from Horizon Herbs. They also sell a set. So anyone interested in buying a set of screens, I'm actually kind of out of stock of these right now. I'm waiting for materials. Um, if you want to buy them from me, um, I should have them up and running again in the next month or two. Uh, Horizon Herbs should um, have them available as well. Hope that helps, Teresa. Um, so you can build a basic set from that hardware cloth. Um, yeah, it's, it's basically a one by two, Teresa. That would work fine. I buy cedar and I mill it down to those, um, to the two inch wide pieces, but you could use a one by two, no problem. Yeah. And then you can also use window screen for the finer screen. And anything larger than a half inch, you could, um, you know, you usually don't need to screen anything bigger than that. But there's also just kitchen colanders and things like that. So that's kind of the basics of how to build it. Um, did that, do you feel like that answered your question okay? Uh, these are one by twos, and if you can't buy a one by one, you can get a one by two and cut it in half, or just make the bottom piece as large as the top, be a little bit harder to handle. But that's essentially how I build these. Uh, Julia, yeah, I definitely, I can ship to Canada. But like I mentioned, I'm, I'm a couple months out on these, so um, um, let me know if you're interested and I'll, I'll get back to you when they're available. Um, otherwise, you should be able to find them from, I think you can also check in Canada, oh, I think it's Salt Spring Seeds. They might sell screens. I'm not sure. All right. Uh, Slippery Dude, are there any issues with seeds or edible crops using gray water? Um, good question. Uh, that's a, a timely question, too. Uh, Julia, I'll get to your other question next, okay? Um, the only issues that I know of with gray water are with um, salt buildup. Uh, so if you use a sodium-based biodegradable soap, that'll build up some salts in the soil. And um, 
Also, it's generally not recommended that the gray water come in contact with the actual part that you're eating. So um, I wouldn't grow, for example, potatoes or carrots or parsnips or radishes, beets, anything like that using gray water, um, unless it's a seed crop and you're not eating it. So um, as far as I know, gray water usage in the garden, some folks don't like to do it. I personally don't mind. It's good if you have uh, a thick mulch so that the gray water doesn't, uh, isn't exposed to the surface um, for any period of time. That'll also encourage the, the fungal life in the soil to take care of anything that's funky or, um, or potentially toxic that will help with that issue. And then, like I mentioned, nothing, you don't want to eat anything that's coming in contact with it. So if you have like, let's say you've got a thick mulch basin, either around a raised bed or um, uh, if you're growing within that mulch basin, um, as long as it's something that isn't coming in contact with the gray water, you should be good to go. So that's the only issue I know of with gray water is the, the actual direct contact and the salt buildup. So if you're using gray water, you know, it's always good to have the option to not. So if you can turn off that gray water and send it to the sewer or the uh, septic or redirect it once in a while, that's good to be able to water with fresh water um, anywhere where you're using gray water. The exception to that would be for a perennial landscape or watering trees. I think it's okay in that instance to, uh, to just have it continually uh, feeding those trees. Um, that answer your question? Let's see, Julia. Uh, <clears throat> what would be a good companion cover crop to crimson clover to build up the nutrients in the soil? My intention is to cut the clover in late August and leave it to decompose over the winter. Any recommendations? Um, so you're looking at a summertime crop to, to sow soon and to cut in the late summer and to leave it to decompose on the surface of the soil over the winter. I think you have a lot of options, Julia. Um, you're looking to build up nutrients in the soil. So um, I imagine by that you mean uh, mainly with nitrogen. Um, some of the deeper rooted will do some phosphorus mining like alfalfa. Uh, but that's related to the clover, so I would probably go with some type of grass um, or even a vetch. Um, you can also do, uh, let's, let's look at the soil building combo from Peaceful Valley, the soil building mix. Uh, let's see. Groworganic.com. This is another good resource, by the way. Peaceful Valley, they are an excellent resource for um, bulk cover crop seed. Okay, so let's go seeds, um, bulk, let's see, cover crop. But I'm thinking possibly, Julia, that a vetch for nitrogen fixation and or uh, maybe a rye or an oat, something that's going to just be good for biomass. The clover is not going to give you a ton of surface biomass. Um, so if you're looking for uh, decomposition on the surface, um, it's not great with that. It does have a nice root system. So um, the roots that are going to die back are great for soil building. Um, but I would probably pair it with, uh, with a vetch or, or an oat of some sort. And let's take a look at it. Is it vetch invasive? It's only invasive if it goes to seed. So if you mow it um, before it uh, sets seed, so like before the actual seed pods are dry, um, you should be fine with that. Yeah, and if it does come up again, um, if it goes to seed and it re sows itself the following spring, as long as you mow it down before it sets seed again, then the invasiveness is over. It's not uh, invasive by, by its roots, so it's not going to spread with its root system. Okay, so let's see what they have here. They've got a soil building mix that we've used before that I liked. Let's see if we can find it here. Mustard Mitch mix, let's see.
right, I'm gonna go back here. Crimson clover with rye or oats or vetch. Yeah, um, I think a rye or an oat would be a good choice for you, Julia. Um, and I also, if you're wanting more nitrogen fixation, that's what the vetch is really great for. Um, cow peas are also an interesting one. Uh, they're a really great nitrogen fixer. So um, that's what I would recommend, Julia, is some sort of grass. Okay? Some sort of grass. And, uh, and also vetch. And I can look into this a little bit more um, as far as good combinations with vetch. And I would also recommend downloading that document from Atra with the cover crops. Budget soil builder mix. Bell beans, field peas, common vetch, and cayuse oats. Okay, so they have oats and vetch. Now the vetch is always a great combo with, with the grasses because it's a climber. Um, and you know, you don't always necessarily need to to grow multiple cover crops together. It's not, it's not always necessary. But um, I do think that uh, either rye um, or oats would be a good combination as well as vetch. Okay, Julie, you got to decide this week. Cool. Okay, well, let me um, let me look at this a little bit more and see what I can come up with for you, okay? <sighs> Does anybody have any other questions? I, I really, really hope that everyone keeps in touch with me because some of you have some really exciting projects going on that I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing more about as they as they progress. Um, Julia, the rye, the rye and the oats do not provide nitrogen. Um, they're mainly going to be for soil building. Uh, they have huge root masses and uh, a lot of biomass above the soil. The clover is going to give you some nitrogen though. Um, and you can actually, if, you, if you're looking at the screen share right now, you'll see that they sell uh, crimson clover seed that's coated. Um, that's a, it's called nitro-coated. And basically what that is, is it's coated, the seed is coated with an inoculant. And um, they found that the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, that if you inoculate the seed with that bacteria, um, compared to what is naturally found in the soil or what would naturally occur when you plant a nitrogen fixing crop like clover, if it's inoculated, it fixes way, way more nitrogen. So whatever nitrogen fixing seed you buy, if it's crimson clover, get it nitro coated, get it coated with the inoculant and that's really going to help. Teresa, what's your opinion of dwarf SX uh, wrap as a cover crop? I used it last year and noticed a big difference where it was. Um, I don't have personal experience with using that as a cover crop. I know that um, it is the same species sometimes as uh, the canola, so there's some, some issues with um, GMO crossing. But if you're not saving seeds from it, that shouldn't be really an issue. Um, but most of the mustards as cover crops are mainly for biomass building. They're not nitrogen fixers. So uh, they most certainly are going to uh, benefit when it comes to that. So either 
Um, growing them as a crop to add to the compost pile because of the sheer amount of biomass they produce or for root matter. Um, it's a good one for that. So that's, that's a little I know about that. <clears throat> good question though, yeah. Uh, Yarrow, for incorporating fresh manure, are there any guidelines for the amount of time before harvesting from those plots? Uh, yeah, there are. Um, in fact, I believe that the guideline, at least from the perspective of, of organic standards, certification standards, I believe it was 150 days. Um, it might have even been longer than that, Yarrow. So uh, the longer, the better, for sure. Um, if you're incorporating it and then planting um, at some point, uh, hopefully not directly into it, but kind of soon after incorporating it, um, that uh, you're just going, I wouldn't eat anything that's a root crop or that's a, a touching that raw manure for a while. So I would either compost it first or give it that, give it that amount of time for sure. I, and I can look into that again, but I believe it was 150 days. Might have been, might have been 120 days, like four months. Yeah. Teresa, my lentils and peas are doing well. and Didn't use the inoculant. Yeah, the inoculant is not really necessarily. Um, I know that they recommend putting them just for planting and for food crops. It's more for the nitrogen fixation. Um, I've done, I've had good crops of beans and peas with and without the inoculant. So I think a lot of times they, they add it as an upsell, but uh, it's really good to have. If you're growing it for the purpose of fixing nitrogen, then it's definitely recommended. Oh, you tilled it in, nice. Oil seed radish for a cover crop. Um, I really like it, Julia. Yeah, um, I really, really like it, especially for soil building. I like, uh, and kind of in the same, kind of in the same, along the same lines would be a daikon, daikon or oilseed radish. It's just such a massive, massive root. Um, so I know you're in a cooler climate. I can imagine just kind of mowing that down in the late summer, <clears throat> letting the biomass just kind of chill on the, uh, on the surface. That could be a good one to mix with your clover, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, and not even necessarily in large quantities, like uh, maybe three to one, four to one clover, clover to radish. That, that's a really good one for building up that organic matter for sure. Yeah, radish, it's incredible, right? The size of those daikons or the oilseed radishes, they, get, they just get huge. And just think about that dying and decomposing in that top eight, 10, 12 inches of soil. Good stuff. Oh, awesome, I see. Nice, good to hear, Teresa, yeah. Another good uh, uh, cover crop, especially for kind of more of a garden scale, is fava bean. It grows super fast, it fixes a ton of nitrogen, and you can actually just knock it down and till it in or dig it in and plant right into it. Whereas everything else, especially with clover, um, with clover in particular, it after you mow it or till it, you have to wait a little while because it has um, uh, it has allopathic effects in the soil for what you're going to grow afterwards. So, 15 pounds per acre of clover. yeah, Julia. So, I would maybe maybe go like three to five pounds, or let's see, let's see here. Oh, look what I just found. Let's see. Slippery dude. Yeah, fava beans are awesome. Definitely. Uh, tillage radish into a forage. That's for foraging. Two pounds per acre. Um, 
let's see. Cover crop seeds, six pounds per acre. So you might need even less. It's a heavier seed. Eight to 10 pounds when standalone for radish. So if it's not a standalone, cut that in half at least. So yeah, maybe again, like a two or three pounds per acre to mix in with that clover, uh, Julia. That might be good. Fava beans, tw minus 22. I have a feeling they might not they might not handle that. I know they are somewhat frost tolerant. That might be too cold for favas. Julia, for the vegetable garden, last year I left the bean and pea plants in the garden over the winter to decompose. This year, do I just move aside the old plants and plant among it or remove it first? Um, beans and peas, uh, why don't you just like till them in? Yeah. Or if you don't till them in, maybe just like try to incorporate them a little bit into the soil, like with a digging fork or something. I'm not sure how big your garden is, but if that's doable by hand, just kind of mix them in a little bit into the soil because any, if you leave something on the surface, just kind of for a long period of time, Mostly, I mean, it does some it does some work in the sense of that it becomes a mulch, like it'll help retain moisture, um, like that. But if you if it's not incorporated into the soil at all, then uh, that biomass just kind of gets lost, especially if it's a nitrogen fixer. It kind of the nitrogen just gets lost in the air. So I always like to incorporate it a little bit, even if it's just kind of putting it into contact with that first couple of inches, top couple of inches of soil, Julia. That's really helpful for, for it to break down as well. But you can also plant right into it as a mulch. Um, I think I talked about that in one of the modules where we did that with, uh, with vetch. So we had, um, we, we drilled like rows of vetch and rows of clover. Um, and the clover became path, and the vetch we mowed. Um, we planted that in the in the autumn. We have mild winters here, so we mowed the vetch in the spring, and planted into that vetch mulch. So we had starts of peppers and starts of tomatoes. They went right into the mulch of the vetch, and it worked beautifully. It was a really excellent crop of tomatoes and peppers from that. It was a really elegant way to do it too. So you can try either way. Yeah, if you think it'd be valuable mulch to have the debris in the surface, go for it. Um, and yeah, I'll let you know. I'm going to look into the cover crops a little bit more. And so let's keep in touch on that, Julia. <clears throat> Slippery dude, fava should overwinter as long as it has really good cover to protect from the cold. They grow in the Middle East mountains, so they should adapt as long as there's a coat of organics or mulch to protect them. So it sounds like they just need some protection in the soil level. But the foliage will survive. Is that what you're saying, Slippery Dude? I don't have experience with that in a cold climate. Um, but yeah, it sounds like, Teresa, it's worth a try. Even as cold as minus 22 uh, with a good, a good cover of mulch. My pleasure, Julia. Thanks for the questions. And I'm so glad that, that you were a part of the course. Everybody, thank you for these questions. And I'm, I'm going to miss these interactions for sure but I, I really want to keep in touch here. Cover crops is, is it's a whole world on its own. And uh, we, we ended up getting into cover crops, um, which is a, a brief little side story. Uh, we had been farming by hand for almost three years, and we started to notice just the soil start to decline. Um, and we wanted to incorporate cover crops. And uh, on a small scale, it's definitely doable by hand. <clears throat> so, but we were at a scale where we needed to start building the soil in a way that was manageable with cover crops. And in order to do that, we felt like we needed some bigger tools. So that cover cropping and building the soil is actually what inspired us to get a walk behind tractor with a, a flail mower and a tiller. Um, and from that point on, cover crops became a standard. Um, 
we would grow two vegetable crops and then a cover crop, two vegetable crops and then a cover crop and always rotating. And we had some good results with fava. Uh, we had some really good results with um, a wheat cover crop. And like I mentioned, the vetch and clover one, um, we did some experiments with rye and rye was a really good one. Uh, we did some Sudan grass cover crops. That was kind of a mess, but uh, a lot of biomass. <clears throat> uh, Julia, are you doing another course afterwards? Um, yes, but I'm not sure when. Uh, I want to do another course that's more geared towards growing food um, and probably more geared towards beginners. And um, I don't think I'm going to be doing another seed saving course this year, but um, I will probably be doing another course similar next year um, and possibly a little bit differently, but uh, I would love to have some feedback on everyone's experience with this. I want to know what worked and what didn't. If you're willing to share that feedback honestly with me, I would really appreciate it. But um, yeah, I, I want to do another course. I, if I can make it happen this year, I'm going to. Um, I want to do a course that's video based and uh, geared towards more of kind of like, not necessarily beginner gardeners, like never evers, but more towards uh, folks who've been gardening for a few years and just kind of um, from soil to harvest and everywhere in between. So that's kind of what I'm working on um, next couple of months. So I'll, I'll keep everybody posted as that uh, progresses for sure. But yeah, everyone's got some good some good projects going out there. I know Julia, you, I'd really love to keep in touch and hear about your farming and uh, and your cover cropping. And Teresa, you got such an awesome <laughs> sounding backyard with you, uh, such a huge plant lover. Um, and your charred seed or your uh, sugar beet seed project. Uh, Aaron, I know you're working on your uh, your indigenous. Um, variety preservation, which is awesome. Let's see, Slippery Dude. It'd be great to have an invite to maybe annually do a chat to discuss interesting experiments, projects, undertaking the like. Kind of open class reunion of course, sorts. I love that idea. <clears throat> yeah, I love that idea. And yeah, let's totally do that. Um, in fact, I would even love to do that later on in the year, like maybe September, October, and just hear about how everybody's year panned out. It's a really good idea. Yeah, that would be super fun. My projects for the year, well, I'm working on, I'm working on that other course, but uh, I have, my garden is kind of in limbo right now because uh, we have to move. Um, we don't have to move until next spring, so I'm going to keep it going. But that always kind of <clears throat> puts a fork in the road as far as how much energy and time to put in, knowing that I'm going to have to walk away from it. But, uh, you know, it's all about the journey, really. So um, I'm going to do some I'm going to do some tomatoes and some squash this year. That's kind of my big goal is to do some new varieties of tomatoes, try some new ones I've never tried. And uh, and do some. Uh, I want to do some different species of squash. Squash. I want to do some. Uh, I think the cucurbita machata is the one I'm most interested in, like the butternut species. I know they're not as long storing, but there's some really cool varieties out there. So that's kind of what I'm working on in the garden, in and out of the garden. <clears throat> But I love that idea, and I will absolutely uh, keep in touch too about doing a um, doing a hangout later on in the year. Great idea, yeah. So I'm I'm gonna get that email out to everybody in the next uh, probably in the next hour. And um, again, please keep in touch. 
we can even keep the Facebook group group going. There's no reason to close that down. So maybe that uh, after the course will will actually be a good way to to stay in touch as well. But like I said, I'm I'm open to to helping however I can with with your projects as they as they move forward. So. Teresa, I have the sugar beets and the experimental farm network stuff, plus a couple of things for other people and my own seed saving. Yeah, you've got your hands full out there. <laughs> you definitely do. Awesome. Slippery dude, I'm working on getting my keister out of, out of California and back to Hawaii. That's right. In the meantime, helping others get rid of their lawns and converting a low maintenance landscape and our veggie gardens with vertical growth in the direction. Great. We need so many people doing that. As you know, I'm in Southern California, so and you're you're not quite in as bad shape up there, I don't think, but it's getting dire here with water, like absolutely dire. It's gonna be a very interesting year. And yeah, I, I look forward to hearing uh, hearing about your process in Hawaii too. That's just a whole nother world out there. Um, as far as just what is commonly grown and the process of, of gardening and seed saving when there's a decent amount of rain and totally different soil types and high humidity and all that. But at least you've got mangoes <laughs> and pineapple and papaya and, uh, what else? Dragon fruit, jackfruit. I mean, you're in fruit paradise, right? Fifty-five pepper plants, plants trees. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, you have your hands full. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of us would like to hear about your process. Uh, slippery dude. When when are you moving to Hawaii? Is that happening this year? And what part of Hawaii do you already know? Where, where are you going? What What is the climate like there? Wow, Julia, you've got your hands full too. <laughs> That's a really big garden. Chickens, the field, and doing some selecting and crossing experiments. Very cool. That's a lot, but looks like good stuff. Yeah, the water, the water situation, slippery dude, is bad. Oh man, I, I honestly don't know what they're gonna do. If I think this year, I mean, I think we're okay for this year down here in, in Ojai. Our, the lake is at forty percent, and some of the wells in the valley are still pumping. The well on the land that I'm in is still is still going, so um, that's good. But. After, I mean, if next winter it doesn't rain, like I literally, I, I don't know if people can even live here anymore. Like I don't know where they're going to get the water from. They just, can, you can only take from somewhere else for so long before it's just unsustainable. So, and that's not enough time to actually, you know, implement some other process, some, you know, like a desal plant locally. So crazy. Yeah. We'll see. Knocking on wood. This isn't wood. But I'm gonna knock on it anyways. Slippery dude, Hamakua coastline near Hanokoa, Hanoka, hopefully around 2,000 feet. So that's a decent elevation in Hawaii, right? Wild coffee banana. Oh, bananas! I forgot about bananas. Wild coffee, bananas, papaya. And the list is growing daily. It sounds sounds incredible. It sounds incredible.
doesn't rain next year in California. It's the new Baja. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's the new Baja, but with like a thousand times the population. That's the scary part. Yeah. I know it's crazy. <sighs> it's crazy, Julia. Yeah. Honestly, you know, there's something that's kind of refreshing about it. I don't know. I don't even know how to exactly say this, but there's something refreshing about just natural processes undermining kind of our ideals of living wherever we want. You know, maybe, maybe this drought is actually going to force people to move. Uh, and it sounds really unsettling, but at the same time, it's like, you can't argue with it. And sometimes that, that natural process I actually find is really refreshing. So maybe we'll pick up and move to Argentina <laughs> and live on my, my, my girlfriend's father's ranch. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Yara, you got some rain right now. Oh, nice. I'm jealous. Cool. Yeah. It might be head north or head way south. That might be the solution. Or maybe head east, east of the Rockies. Yeah. Well, this has definitely been fun, friends. It's it's been so great to meet all of you through this course. I I'm just I'm really grateful for each and every one of you, and um, I appreciate you supporting this and being a part of it and being so engaged and inspired with all of your awesome projects. And I I just look forward to the future and really really hope to stay in touch with everybody. So um, look out for my email later. Uh, let's keep in touch on the Facebook group. Uh, Slippery Dude, great idea with the Hangout. It's on for sure. Um, I'm going to set a reminder right now to do that. Um, maybe September would be great for that. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and sign off on the, on the Hangout. But if we all want to keep chatting, <laughs> that, uh, that's good for me. Um, thank you. Thank you. So much gratitude. And uh, let's keep let's keep moving on. Let's keep doing it. You're all doing such great work. So um, keep it up. Keep in touch. Many blessings. Be well. And uh, thank you again for for being a part of this. All right. Signing off. Peace.